All right, so we are now on to section five of unit six. Uh, we are looking at the workers, the people who were carrying this industrial revolution. All right, let's start with this time period is called the Gilded Age. Now, when I say gilded, I want you to think of like plated or costume jewelry. It looks nice and shiny on the outside. It looks gold, but on the inside, it's not real. It's, it's hollow. It's fake. That is what the Gilded Age was meant to be. This is a term that's, a, that's created by Mark Twain, and it, it is used to describe the industrial expansion in the United States. So industrial expansion allowed for the economy to grow. It produced great wealth for factory owners, the, the mines, the railroads, large farms, uh, but the general improvements that were brought to American society were brought with, uh, with, a, with a cost. Uh, those that worked in the factories were the cost, the men, the women, the children, the immigrants who struggled to survive while these big businesses grew. So the Gilded Age was a term created by Mark Twain that said industrial expansion is the thin gold layer on the outside. The shiny looks great, draws people in, and the social issues are the dark reality that had been masked by that thin gold layer. Uh, so this this is the direction we're going in here today. What did uh, what was the inside the darkness, the terrible things that were happening? First, we have the factory conditions. The goal of factories at this time was to maximize the profits, okay? In order to maximize profits, you have to cut costs somewhere else. And the places they were cutting costs was the people they were paying, the wages. They're going to employ people who would work willingly for low wages. Oftentimes, immigrants, children, women were those that would work for low wages and take any job no matter what the dangers might be. Factory workers are going to spend long hours in small, cramped, hot, dirty, dark places, these factories, known as sweatshops that were not regulated at all, not by the government at least. Their workload was strictly regulated by management, but the conditions were not looked at by the government at all. Because of these low wages, this meant that everybody in the family needed to work. Both parents especially needed to work in order to make ends meet. Children often went to work instead of going to school and in an effort to stay off the streets and help their families survive. So the conditions that these factories created forced everybody to take part in the workplace. Because of the conditions that people are going to be met with, rumblings of labor unions are going to be brought up. In the early 1820s, during that first industrial revolution, factory workers tried to gain power against their employers by using a tactic called collective bargaining. Collective, we all together. A collective is a group. Bargain or negotiate. What were they negotiating for? Higher wages and better working conditions. The story of every union. Industrialization, though, lowered the prices of consumer goods because they're mass producing them. The problem was that even with those low prices, the average consumer, which was the factory workers, didn't make enough to buy them. And that's what's going to push these workers to take their complaints directly to their employers. Uh, and those employers are not going to like this labor movement. Reason being, Employers saw them as a threat to their business. If laborers got what they wanted, that meant that the factory owners weren't making as much money. 
because they had to make the workplace better, which cost money. They had to pay the workers more, which cost money. And the workers would be working less hours, which again, lost them money. So employers are not going to be in favor of this growing labor movement. The very first uh, labor union on the scene is going to be the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor is going to be founded in 1869 by Uriah Smith Stevens, who was a tailor. The goal of this union was to take any workers, all types, of any trade, skilled or unskilled, Skilled workers were often educated, specialized workers. Think of like your engineers, your plumbers, your mechanics, doctors, okay? Unskilled workers that can be easily replaced. Oftentimes these factory workers, they didn't need a lot of training. But this union would take them all, anybody and everybody. In 1881, Terence Powderly is going to become the leader of the Knights of Labor. Under his leadership, 700,000 people, men and women of every race and ethnicity, are going to grow the union membership. What they're fighting for is the eight-hour workday, getting rid of child labor, equal pay for equal work, and they were also calling for political reforms. One of their ideas was a graduated income tax that basically said, you pay as much taxes as you can afford. The more you make, the more taxes you pay. The less you make, the less taxes you pay. So they kind of have a lot of different issues because they have a lot of different members. The Knights of Labor are going to use strikes as a way to get their demands met. That will ultimately lead to their downfall. The next labor union that we see is going to be the American Federation of Labor. They are going to be led by Samuel Gompers and they're gonna be formed in 1886. Now this union is a little bit different. They are only going to take skilled workers from local unions who are devoted to their special craft or trade. So they're only taking skilled workers. They are also gonna set union dues, very high union dues. These dues would be used in case of a strike so that people would still be making money. And they're gonna be used for a pension fund. So when you retire or if something happened, uh, you would have some assistance as a worker. Now, the AFL, the American Federation of Labor, is going to be known for their bread and butter issues, the basics, the bread and butter. And these issues are going to be very simple, better wages, better conditions, better hours. That's it. They become known as the labor, for, the labor union for the bread and butter issues. Now, they are going to be a slightly different from the Knights of Labor in that they'll only use strikes as a last resort. This union, the American Federation of Labor, the AFL, really wants to, you know, use that collective bargaining, uh, peacefully uh, negotiate to get their bread and butter issues solved, not really fighting in the way of strikes. Okay? They, they see that as violent, a little beneath them. And remember, they're skilled workers, so they're already a little bit higher up. And that's the actions that they take. Another labor union at this time is going to be the International Workers of the World, uh, the IWW. Their, their nickname is going to be the Wobblies. Uh, this is going to be established by the Western Federation of Miners and other groups. They are going to oppose what we call class collaboration. And they are going to say the American Federation of Labor, they're those hoity-toity higher-ups, see them as better than we are workers, and we don't want to be a part of that skilled workers-only club anyway. We want our own labor union where anybody can feel free to join. The leaders of this, this union are going to be William D. Hayward and Eugene Debs. We're going to see Eugene Debs' name come up again tomorrow in our discussions. 
but he is going to be one of the leaders of the Wobblies. This union, unlike the AFL, is going to be primarily made of unskilled workers, farm workers, miners, loggers, uh, and they're going to be organized on a class basis, uh, welcoming anybody and everybody. They say, you know what, we'll take all the workers that the AFL denies because we want to fight for everybody's rights. Now, the international workers of the world are going to use direct action, strikes or boycotts to get their demands met. So again, very different from the AFL who really wanted to negotiate. They are going to be criticized for these actions, the international workers of the world, being seen as lowly unions, proving that they're bad for society, being violent to get their needs met. So two very different unions that we see here. The very last union that we need to talk about is the Congress for Industrial uh, Organizations, the CIO. The CIO is going to be created by John L. Lewis in 1938, so way into the future. But why we talk about this is because they're going to organize the mass production industries, which at that time was the steel and the automobile workers. Lewis originally wanted to organize a committee of unskilled workers within the American Federation of Labor. But the American Feder Federation of Labor wouldn't hear of it. Remember, they're only skilled workers, hoity-toity, skilled workers. So the CIO is going to break away, create their own union, the Congress for Industrial Organizations, and it won't be until 1955 that these two unions come back together, joining skilled and unskilled workers. They had been rivals from 1938 until 1955. Uh, and when they come back together, they're going to be one of the largest labor unions in the United States. The CIO will accept African Americans and women, being similar to their, uh, the originator of the labor unions, the Knights of Labor, who also did the same. So what actions do these labor unions take? Well, we're going to look at specific strikes, but what I want to end this, this part of the, uh, the unit on is what actions can be taken by workers. So we have two categories here that can be taken by workers. First, we are going to see uh, labor union actions. Uh, so what can the workers do? First, they can strike. So they can withhold uh, their labor until they get their demands met. So they, you know, they're on the picket lines. We won't work. We won't work. Uh, they can also boycott, which is a refusal to buy a product. Uh, and finally, they can sabotage. They can tamper with factory equipment, making it impossible for production to happen. What all three of these have in common, though, is that they're costing the company money. If the workers refuse to work, then no work is getting done. If, if consumers refuse to buy the product, no money is being made. And if they sabotage the equipment, then nothing can happen. Nobody can work and no product can be produced. So they hit the big business owners in their pocketbook in order to get their demands met. Now on the flip side of this is what is the business, what is the management doing to stop labor unions? Well, first of all, why would they want to stop labor unions? Remember, I said big business owners don't like labor unions because they cost them money. They don't want to pay and do uh, meet the demands of the labor unions. So they want to stop them. How do they do that? First, they create blacklists. Uh, this is a list of workers that had joined unions or caused trouble. They put them on this list and they circulate it to the people who do the hiring at these different workplaces. And they say, you know what, this person, they're going to cause you trouble. You don't want to hire them. Uh, and, and that kind of blackballs them from ever getting a job. A lockout. This is where you literally lock the doors and you don't allow workers to come in until they accept the conditions that they are 
being told to accept. Uh, in a lockout, workers do not get paid when they are not working. So they're basically uh, put on, uh, uh, they, there was no unemployment, so they were not working with no paycheck. And a paycheck at a place where the conditions aren't that great is better than no paycheck and your family starving. Yellow dog contracts. These were contracts that were given to employees before they were hired saying, if you want this job, you are going to promise to never ever join a union. And if you promise to never join a union, then you can have this job. If you don't, well, maybe your name ends up on a blacklist. And the last action by management were scabs. These were workers that were hired to end strikes. They were workers that would come in and do the job that these laborers were refusing to do. And this is management saying, hey, if you don't want to do the job, look at all of these people that we have who are willing to do the job in your place. So both labor actions and management actions, they both hit the pocketbook of their enemy. Because really, at this time, the only thing that talked was money. Now, next time we come together, we're going to talk about specific strikes that happened that were led by laborers and labor unions to help take down these bad business practices. <laughs>